It's never too early to play holiday music, and it's never too early to start thinking about your gifts. Whether it's for a friend or the friends in your pants, you can make this a season to be jolly with Manscaped. Visit manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the offer code SKILLUP. Click below or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Gamers, big news. I am headed to the Game Awards next week. That's right, Jeff Keighley calls me and he's like, hey, shill up, wanna come hang out with me and Kojima? And I'm like, really? And he's like, nah, I'm fucking with you, but you can still come to the Game Awards so long as you sit at the back. So that's me, ladies and gents. I'm on a 24 hour flight next week, arriving in the land of the McRib on Wednesday, Game Awards on Thursday, and then recording a very special episode of the podcast at a very special location. Quite pumped about that one, stay tuned. In the meantime, though, we've got one of the biggest release weeks of the year on our hands. Dark Tide, Need for Speed, Midnight Suns, and Callisto Protocol all drop within a few days of each other. So I've been trying to keep up with all that. Not to mention all the gaming news that keeps dropping this week, like how Microsoft basically admitted that Sony games were better. Don't believe me? Here comes the news. Okay, before the console wars break out in earnest, please put down your pitchforks and your crying Wojak JPEGs. Hear me out, allow me to explain. This week, a fire main's worth of information spewed out about Microsoft's efforts to buy Activision Blizzard, and Sony hitherto's very successful effort to stop that transaction from going through. A major sticking point has been the exclusivity of Call of Duty, with Sony seeking some sort of guarantee that the game would remain multi-platform in perpetuity. But Sony's pressure there has proven to be so effective that it's now brought scrutiny to the entire deal, and there's a real risk that the transaction might collapse in a heap. This failure could come from any number of places. Right now, the British CMA and the European Commission are examining the deal, with both agencies voicing skepticism given the size of the acquisition and its possible anti-competitive implications. A new threat emerged this week in the form of the US Federal Trade Commission, or FTC. Earlier, the New York Times had reported that it had caught wind of FTC interest in the deal, and this week Politico took that further, saying that according to three sources, the FTC is likely to challenge the acquisition. Quote, a lawsuit challenging the deal is not guaranteed, and the FTC's four commissioners have yet to vote out a complaint or meet with lawyers for the companies, two of the people have said. However, the FTC staff reviewing the deal are skeptical of the company's arguments, those people said, end quote. If this does go ahead, an FTC challenge doesn't mean an FTC victory, but it does pose significant risks given the stakes that are involved for Microsoft, who have committed a huge amount to this deal, and you certainly get the impression that Activision Blizzard King would become the new cornerstone of Microsoft's gaming empire were they to acquire it. Particularly on mobile, where Microsoft have almost no presence, but King does very well with games like Candy Crush. While all of this was going on, the British CMA published the arguments they received from both sides. And I tell you what, if these lawyers don't emerge victorious in this dispute, they ought to consider a career in stand-up, because the shit they're saying is funny as fuck. Exhibit A, Your Honor, Sony's submission puts forth the straight-faced opinion that Microsoft's real goal in this acquisition is to turn Sony into another Nintendo, which focuses exclusively on family games, leaving Xbox to corner the market on games for big boys. Quote, Microsoft wants PlayStation to become like Nintendo, so that it would be a less close and effective competitor to Xbox. Post-transaction, Xbox would become the one-stop shop for all the best-selling shooter franchises on console. Call of Duty, Halo, Gears of War, Doom, Overwatch, as the decision explains, and it would then be free from serious competitive pressure, end quote. So there you have it, guys. No shooters on PlayStation, right? I mean, they just listed all the big shooters right there, and PlayStation has zero shooters and zero developers working on big shooters, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I, and apparently Sony's lawyers, forgot that Sony just bought Bungie for $3.6 billion. Funny how they left them off that list. It does get better though, and this is where I genuinely barely laughed. Sony argued, without any hint of irony, that if this deal goes through, Microsoft might raise the price of consoles and games. Quote, Faced with weaker competition, Microsoft would be able to increase console and game prices for Xbox users, including those that switch from PlayStation, increase the price of Game Pass, and reduce innovation and quality." End quote. Now, if you don't find this hilarious, it might be because you missed the fact that Sony were the ones to just put up the price of their console while Microsoft didn't, and Sony were the first ones out the gate with a $70 next-gen price tag for their games, while Xbox is still at $60, and Sony have been well and truly ahead of the pack in charging for next-gen upgrades for their first-party titles, while Microsoft have offered these for free. And don't even get me started on a $70 Last of Us remake. I mean, come on now, I recommended that because it's a good game, but that price tag is a hell of a lot to swallow. So for Sony to be saying this stuff, that takes some seriously big blue balls.
hmm, probably should have worded that differently. Don't worry though, it's not just Sony belting out these barn burners. Xbox are in on the action too, reiterating what they said in the past, most notably the fact that Call of Duty isn't really that good when you think about it. This week though, they took things to a whole other level when they settled once and for all a battle that has raged across all of Twitter and YouTube comment sections for centuries. Is PlayStation better? Question mark. According to Xbox, yes. To quote the Microsoft submission to the CMA, quote, Sony has more exclusive games than Microsoft, many of which are better quality, end quote. So there you have it, guys. Console wars are over. Microsoft admits it. PlayStation, better. That is, of course, not the case. This is just legal posturing, but it remains as funny as ever to see how far these companies are willing to go in order to win this battle. They'll even stoop to the disgusting low of saying nice things about each other. Gross. Swinging back to Bungie for a second, their battle against hackers and cheat providers continues. They recently brought suit against two cheat makers, claiming that their software infringed on Bungie's intellectual property. Sadly, the court largely ruled against Bungie on this, saying that they couldn't prove how cheats infringed on copyright. But they did invite Bungie to submit an amended complaint. Bungie did that, but when they did so, the cheat maker actually countersued Bungie, claiming that Bungie hacked their computers to obtain the information. So you've got a hacker complaining about getting hacked. Bungie denied it and eventually prevailed in the countersuit, but this whole situation is a good example of why these dirtbags are so hard to pin down, as hacks still occupy a legal grey area where legislation has not caught up, at least not in a lot of countries. I know in China and Korea, they'll throw you in jail if you cheat in online games. Better mess around over there. That sounds like a little much to me. I'd be happy with just some fines and putting these people out of business, but Bungie still seem to be quite some distance from being able to extract even that. Another battle that Sony is fighting is against shovelware flooding the PSN. If you're not familiar with what that is, just imagine really shitty, low quality asset flipped games just thrown together in order to scam a dollar out of an unsuspecting mark. Now yes, that description could apply to any number of AAA live service multiplayer games during their launch windows, but here I'm specifically referring to those budget titles that pop up in the store for a couple of bucks and they're obviously just trash. Most of the time, these lure people in with the promise of easy platinum trophies, since there is a category of weirdo out there who are so obsessed with their gamer score or their trophy count that they're willing to play truly abhorrent trash in order to jack it. Well, no more according to Sony. They sent out a note this week to their developer network saying that both shovelware and easy platinum games will either be shadow banned or delisted entirely, and the developers risk being blacklisted from the PSN altogether. It's a policy that stands in stark contrast to Steam, where any and everything can get on there so long as the developers pay around 100 bucks to list it. But people aren't really incentivized to grab that stuff since no one really cares about Steam achievements. So yeah, sorry trophy hunters, if you want to earn those platinums now, you're going to have to play real games like Saints Row. Have fun. One final piece of Sony news, Gran Turismo might be headed to PC. GTPlanet.net was talking to series creator Kazunori Yamauchi, and they asked him if he was seeing the success of PlayStation titles like Horizon and God of War on PC, and if so, would he consider bringing GT to the PC one day? He replied, yes, but he did note some caveats. Quote, Gran Turismo is a very finely tuned title. There are not many platforms which could run the game in 4K60 natively, so one way we make that possible is to narrow down the platform. It's not a very easy subject, but of course, we are looking into it and considering it." End quote. So that's encouraging. I mean, it's not like there was just a thought bubble that came to him in that meeting. Clearly, it's something that he and his team are actively exploring, and given how successful Sony's PC ports have been, you have to assume that if they can find a way to make it happen, Polyphony Digital are going to want a slice of that pie. Unlikely that we'll hear more about this anytime soon, but it's exciting to imagine a future where both Forza and Gran Turismo are playable on PC. Man, imagine the mods. That would be, that would be crazy. Changing gears now. Get it? Because we talked about a racing game. Anyway, Callisto Protocol is dropping very soon, but it's found itself in a bit of hot water this week when it was revealed that the game will have a season pass which will add new content, and at least some of that content will be new death animations. These are the animations that roll when the main character executes an enemy, or when an enemy dies by some other means. It seems a little weird. I can't think of another game that's added this as a bullet point when talking about their upcoming DLC. Regardless, when news broke, there were plenty of pissed off people who rightly assumed that these animations were essentially being held back from the day one package, and that you're essentially missing out on content unless you upgrade to the season pass. Striking Distance Studio boss Glenn Schofield took to Twitter to clarify the matter, saying, quote, To be clear, we're not holding anything back from the main game for the season pass. We haven't even started work on this content yet. It's all new stuff that we'll be working on in the new year. Fans have asked for even more deaths, so we're making it a priority next year, end quote. 
Fair enough, I guess. I mean, if Elden Ring gets DLC, which it surely will, I'd expect it to have new animations for newly added content, so this tracks. So long as Callisto feels like a complete and polished package on day one, and the DLC ends up being worth the asking price, I suspect people won't stay too fixated on the addition of new death animations. We'll find out how all of this lands very soon though, since Callisto Protocol launches on the second. Did you know that there's excitement building around a potential Dead or Alive or Ninja Gaiden reboot? It got to start at a Korean gaming event called G Star 2022. Team Ninja studio head Fumihiko Yasuda was talking during a panel, and he said that the studio was considering reviving both Dead or Alive and Ninja Gaiden, two franchises that have been dormant for a number of years now, unless you count the volleyball spin offs, which I know we all do. Video Game Chronicle followed up on all of this, and sadly, Team Ninja did pour a bit of cold water on it, saying, quote, It goes without saying that when speaking about the development of our past and future projects, both of these important titles cannot be left without mention. However, there are no details or information to share on either of these franchises at this present time. Like many of our dedicated fans, we share the enthusiasm for the return of these beloved titles, and we will be sure to provide a proper update if and when the day arrives, end quote. It's a bummer, but it makes sense. Right now, Team Ninja are all in on their souls like Wolong Fallen Dynasty, and they just announced Rise of the Ronin, which looks to be a more open world take on the Team Ninja formula, which I'm super keen on, since level design hasn't been their strongest suit to this point. With all that in the mix, it's hard to imagine the studio having time for more projects, but never say never. Just briefly, we got an update on the closure of Anoma, the studio formerly known as Square Enix Montreal. They were recently purchased by Embracer Group, and right after rebranding them, they announced that the studio would be shuttered, with a mix of staff transfer to other studios and straight up job losses. Anoma delivered mobile titles like Lara Croft and Hitman Go, but now they won't be delivering or maintaining anything since a slew of their games will be permanently delisted from app stores and no longer playable even for those that have already bought them. The studio delivered the news on Twitter, quote, Arena Battle Champions Deus Ex Go, Hitman Sniper The Shadows, and Space Invaders Hidden Heroes will be shutting down on January 4th. The games will be removed from the App Store, Google Play Store on December 1st, and current players will not be able to access the game past January 4th. Effective immediately, in-game purchases are stopped. We encourage prior in-game purchases to be used before January 4th, as they will not be refunded. On behalf of the development team, we would like to thank you for playing our games." End quote. So there you go, Dunzo. A real shame to see titles like Deus Ex Go get zapped into the ether, completely lost to time and completely unplayable for anyone in the future. But sadly, it's an all too common occurrence in this era of ephemeral digital ownership. Hopefully the modern community finds a way to preserve these titles because companies certainly can't be relied upon to do that. While Anoma is disappearing, Amazon is shrinking. Right now, there seems to be a bit of a reckoning going on across most big business as it braces for an expected recession, with the tech sector being hit hardest. Case in point, Amazon announced that it was cutting some 10,000 jobs, with a number of those happening within their cloud gaming division. If you weren't aware, Amazon has a cloud gaming product called Luna, but if you haven't heard of it before, then you wouldn't be alone because Amazon is putting very little marketing pump behind it, to the point where I haven't really seen any promotion for it at all after the initial announcement some time ago. It's a kind of weird service, sort of divided up into channels that you subscribe to with clusters of games, rather than being focused on a whole catalog of titles. And yeah, it's just there. Maybe not for much longer though, since job cuts in an area like this are really a good sign, and Google has just exited the market after the failure of Stadia to gain any traction. The cloud space still has mainstays in the form of xCloud and GeForce Now, and you'd think that Amazon would have the financial muscle to shoulder barge their way in, but I guess Stadia is proof that things just don't work that way. All right, a quick lightning round to finish off. Apparently, there's a new AAA Aliens game in the work. Okay, that sounds believable. It's reportedly being made by Grasshopper Manufacturer, Suda51 Studio. The people who made Lollipop Chainsaw, Killer is Dead, and No More Heroes are making an alien game, if Insider Games report is to be believed. I'm a little skeptical on this one. Speaking of AAA, Netflix is reportedly working on their own AAA game. It's being developed at their newly formed LA-based studio, simply called Netflix Game Studio. The team is being led by former Overwatch producer Chaco Sunny, and the job listings hint at Unreal Engine 5 and live service elements. No other details at this point, so don't expect to hear any more on this one for another few years yet. God of War Ragnarok has sold a truckload. Sony tweeted out their flex, with Ragnarok being the fastest selling first party release for PlayStation ever, selling through an impressive five 5.1 million copies in its first week. That's what happens though, right? You make an exceptional game that pushes technical and creative boundaries and it sells, while broken ass, janky, unfinished stuff doesn't sell. Right? Wrong! Because in the same week that God of War announced its 5.1 million units in seven days milestone, Game Freak announced that Pokemon Scarlet and Violet had sold through 10 million units in three days. 
10 million units for a game that looks and runs like shit. People are always asking, why don't Game Freak put more effort into Pokemon? The answer is 10 million units in three days. You bring this on yourselves, Pokemon fans, and it is never going to change, ever. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, not a lot, actually. Next week is the Game Awards, where we're sure to get a slew of big ticket announcements. So this week, it seems like the games industry is kind of holding their breath or keeping their powder dry. We did get an update on Valheim, my number two game of the year last year, and certainly one of the greatest survival games ever made. After its meteoric rise to fame at launch, the game has been starved for major updates, with the promised Mistlands biome nowhere to be seen until now, where it was just announced as available for public testing. Valheim was an extraordinary title at its launch, but its glacially slow pace of updates has been frustrating for those excited about its future, myself included. It was a five-person dev team back at launch. Hopefully they've scaled up since then, because one new biome in 18 months is a little concerning given that there are still a number of biomes teased for the future. Either way, I wish the dev team all the best. Valheim is a very special game and I genuinely can't wait to return to it when it hits 1.0. Speaking of early access, one title I've had on my watch list since forever is Everspace 2. This is a space shooter RPG hybrid where you roam around the galaxy collecting loot to upgrade your ship. It's got a lot of Diablo energy as evidenced by the most recent and final early access update, which just went live this week. It adds an end game with rifts teleporting you to dangerous new sections of space where you can sit difficulty modifiers to increase your risk and reward. The update also adds new missions, new legendary items, and tons more. It was the last early access update, which means release is just around the corner. Early access feedback on this one has been very positive. People love it, and I love watching footage of it. I think it looks sick. Can't wait to get stuck into this one sometime early next year. Hopefully not February. And finally, not exactly an announcement, but Bayonetta 4 is all but confirmed. Game director Kamiya was speaking on a Japanese social media site when he responded to someone asking about Bayonetta 3's ending, which has proven to be controversial or disappointing or confusing, depending on who you ask. And I won't spoil it here. Kamiya responded saying, quote, I don't think it was unexpected at all, but it seems that the ending of Bayonetta 3 wasn't conveyed correctly to everyone. So I think Bayo 4 will be an unexpected development for everyone. After all, when Bayo 4 comes out, I'm sure there will be people who say, you added this as an afterthought. So I I will say it now, end quote. There are a few different aspects of that ending that proved to be controversial, so it's not clear exactly what he's referring to here, but the bottom line is that Bayonetta 4 exists, at least in his mind, and if Nintendo agree to pony up the dough again, we can expect a fourth outing in three or four years. Or maybe eight years, if the gap between two and three stays the same. So what came out last week? Well, the only big hitters were Gungrave Gore and Evil West, both of which we covered off last week as the review embargoes had already dropped. TLDR, both are old school inspired, but Gungrave is perhaps a little too old school, while Evil West strikes a better balance, but is still a love or hated affair. If you want to hear more about them, I'll leave a link to last week's episode and my Evil West review below the like button. So what's coming out this week? Well, I warned you, I told you there was one big crazy week left in the year, and here it is, the last hurrah of 2022, and it is going out with a bang. First up, it's small, but it's important to me. Sable arrives on the PS5 today. This is one of my games of the year from last year. A truly wonderful, serene, exploratory experience with a captivating art style and a soundtrack so good that I still listen to it very regularly. If you like games like Gris or Abzu or Journey, then you will love this. It's wonderful. Sony ponies, don't skip it. Soccer Story is an interesting one. You might remember Golf Story from a while back, the Switch exclusive golf RPG hybrid. This is not the same developer or publisher but it does seem to be riffing on that idea. A top-down adventure game, very reminiscent of classic Zelda titles. They're like, it's dangerous to go alone, take this. But instead of handing you a torch, they hand you a soccer ball. I like it. Soccer Story arrives on all platforms today and it's on Game Pass. Just briefly, I shouted out The Night Witch last week in my Put This On Your Radar segment. That one drops today on all platforms. The Front Mission series is back, remade exclusively for the Nintendo Switch. Classic mech-based strategy game appears to have been lovingly recreated here with some very impressive visuals and a fully orchestrated soundtrack. This is the first of three planned remakes and it is out tomorrow. Gundam Evolution is that free-to-play Overwatch-style team shooter that hit PC a little while ago, launching only in select territories, RIP Australia. This one is apparently pretty good. I did a podcast recently with Jake Baldino, Yong Ye, and Alana Pierce, and she was going on about it. She really loved it. 
If you'd like to check it out for yourself, but you're on PlayStation or Xbox, then good news, it arrives tomorrow on your platforms. Like I said, it is free to play. However, it may not be in your territory. So don't be surprised if it doesn't turn up when you search for it in your storefront of choice. Final release of November is Warhammer 40K Darktide, arriving exclusively for the PC right now as the console versions have been delayed to an unspecified date. So, Darktide. Now, I've put about 20 hours into this. I fucking love it. I really do. I'm not even a big 40k dude, but the level of immersion that this thing brings is just off the charts and the gameplay is so good and the soundtrack, oh my lord, oh, it's fantastic. However, the technical state of this is woeful. Some people are having no problems at all. Good for them. I'm having every problem from frame rates to stability to server issues. I know I'm not alone in that, by the way, as many other people have said the same thing. It's been available this past week as part of a pre-order early access beta. I essentially said that I'm going to put this down until the official release on the 30th. At that point, more patches will have rolled through and most of the launch content will be in. I say most because there are some additional features coming post launch, like the ability to play solo or create custom lobbies and some crafting stuff. It's a whole thing. Bottom line, here's my advice on this one. If you like Warhammer 40K and you don't mind plenty of technical glitches and some missing features, you should grab this. As a foundation for the future, it's fantastic. But if you demand more technical polish or feature completeness, then maybe sit this one out for now because it's definitely not finished. The good news is that it is on Game Pass. So if you'd like to check it out, then that's definitely the safest way to do so. I'm working on a full review of it, which will hopefully go live next week. If you'd like to know the minute that video is live, then be sure to hit the subscribe button and ding the notification bell. You may as well throw this video a like while you're at it. Why not? All right, pushing on to December. On the 1st, Inscription arrives on the Switch. Very nice. But it's the 2nd of December where things get crazy. First up is Need for Speed Unbound, which arrives on all platforms bar the Switch. This one, not gonna lie, seems a little odd. Announced very late after numerous leaks and rumors, very little in the way of marketing, and there's no pre-release review window for this either. Media get it at the same time as early access pre-order customers do, which is actually the 29th. But hey, the official release is on the 2nd, so that's what we're going off. Gameplay for this looks pretty good. I'm digging the animated flair and the anime stylings, but yeah, it's just a little odd that EA seemed to be sneaking this one out the door. I really hope it's good. Next up is Marvel's Midnight Suns, also launching on the second and also coming to all platforms by the Switch. This comes from XCOM developer Firaxis, who leave behind their sci-fi military setting for something a little more mainstream comic book heroes. The combat model that served as the bedrock foundation for most of their titles has also been completely remixed, this time relying on randomly drawn cards representing hero abilities. This is a huge change for Firaxis and a big gamble for them given how much this moves beyond their comfort zone. I will tell you that I have finished this and I will have a review up later this week. I did a preview earlier for this one where I was like, the combat rules, but the other stuff, not so much. I'm under embargo now, so I can't really talk about how my thoughts may have changed since then. But like I said, that review drops later this week. Subscribe, bell, you know the drill. Finally, the Callisto Protocol, spiritual successor to Dead Space, as in made by the same people who went and formed a new studio after the collapse of Visceral Games. The hype for this one is nuts because it looks rad, incredible visuals, gory action, and it's a nice underdog story that I think we can all get behind since it's nice to see this team come back together and pick up where they left off. I just got sent a review code for this like an hour ago. It's going to be very tough for me to hit the review embargo, but I'm going to do my best. Expect that video up at the end of the week. If I can swing it, I will keep you posted. Hey, put this on your radar. Anyone who's played Ori is immediately going to be like, oh, hey, they took that Ori mechanic and made a whole game out of it. To which I reply, yes. And? Ori's traversal through those sands was one of the true highlights of what was already a pretty remarkable game. And given the fate of the Ori franchise is far from certain, I'm glad to know that at least one developer is picking up this mechanic and running with it. This is Pepper Grinder from developer Arek. Can't find too much on these guys other than they're based in Oregon, apparently. I think this is their debut release, but don't quote me on that. It's being published by Devolver Digital, who, as we know, do not miss. So if their scouts have seen fit to add it to their portfolio, then that's usually more than enough reason to keep an eye on it. Pepper Grinder appears to be a little more than a straight up 2D platformer with a focus on fluidity, but the pixel art looks especially charming. And there's at least one section in there with a Gatling gun. So that's nice. Looks like a great Switch or Steam Deck title. I'm keen for it and I'll be checking it out when it drops sometime next year. No date yet. If you'd like to put it on your radar by wishlisting it, I've left a link to it over on my Steam Curator page, which also has links to all of the other put this on your radar stuff I've recently covered. 
I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now and not a whole lot to shout out this week as we are in the back end of the month awaiting the announcement of the December lineups. There is Epic as always, of course. Right now you can still grab the excellent Star Wars Squadrons for Nyx. Grab a VR headset if you can swing it and you'll have yourself an absolute ball. Getting quick though, because in the next few days that will disappear replaced by two new titles. The first is Fort Triumph, a strategy game that aims to cross the combat of XCOM with the world exploration of Heroes of Might and Magic. Sounds like a pretty good combo actually. That one's 79% mostly positive on Steam. The other title on offer is RPG in a Box. Want to make games but don't know anything about anything like me? Then RPG in a Box is for you, allowing you to create simple grid-based voxel style games. Probably not going to produce the next Game of the Year nominee, but likely a good place to start out if you're interested to tinker around in some basic game design. Outside of that, all we have to shout out this week is the Game Pass lineup, which as we mentioned earlier, does include Gungrave Gore, Soccer Story, June Spice Wars and Ghost Lore. Battlefield 2042 is on there now, and that game has definitely picked up a lot of momentum after its abysmal launch, with recent concurrent player counts on Steam as high as 17,000 just this week, no doubt helped by heavy Black Friday discounting. But the real jewel is Darktide, available on the 30th, and like I said, given how janky this thing is, Game Pass does seem like the safest way to dip your toe in. Our feel-good story for the week takes us to an unlikely destination, the mercurial and scam-ridden world of crypto finance. Recently, crypto hasn't been doing so well, as a number of large crypto institutions have gone under, because they were like, oh yeah, that money that you gave us, uh, it's gone, sorry, how bad. Case in point, FTX, once a darling of the crypto world, and now a Michael Lewis movie in the making. Led by the, I'm gonna say, follically well-endowed Sam Bankman Fried, his business has been revealed to be little more than a Ponzi scheme, with billions of dollars of other people's money mysteriously vanishing when the run on FTX started. At the moment, Bankman Fried is still a free man, but at least we can take solace in the knowledge that he's trapped somewhere. Elo Hell. That's right, Bankman Fried plays League of Legends and he's really, really bad at it. The Financial Times spent 2,000 words detailing just how much this dude sucks at this game, despite his best efforts. Apparently, he was playing League of Legends during work meetings with investment funds who were trying to buy into FTX. So while he was losing billions of dollars of other people's money, he was also losing hundreds of games of League of Legends. He has reportedly played over 1,000 games of League, and despite this, he never got above Bronze 2, maintaining a win rate of less than 50% according to various stat tracking websites. Bronze 2, by the way, is like part of the bottom league of nine leagues. To be stuck there for more than a thousand games, you have to be seriously bad at League of Legends. Unclear which is worse, prison showers or a ranked game of League in bronze. Hopefully, if justice prevails, Bankman Fried will be able to compare the two and let us know. And that's the show, ladies and gentlemen. Big week on the channel. As I said, we've got Marvel's Midnight Suns going up tomorrow, and I'm going to try and get that Callista review before the embargo, but no promises. I'm working on Dark Tide in the background, and then I'm off to the Game Awards. Absolutely wild. Looking forward to high-fiving my podcast buddies over there, since Australia is the arse end of the world and we never get to see anyone. We'll still do a new show next week as planned, and then we've only got a few shows left in the year before we do a year in review wrap-up and Game of the Year 2022. Exciting times. I hope you'll be there for it all. If any Anything I've said tickles your fancy, then do be sure to hit the subscribe button and ding the notification bell. And if you wouldn't mind, clicking the thumbs up button on this video is always a very big help. I appreciate that. I appreciate you. Have a great week. Stay out of trouble. All right, I never do this, but I'm going to read the official copy sent to me by Manscaped for this Christmas read. Are you ready? Here we go. This Christmas, do your little drummer boy a favor and use the lawnmower 4.0 to avoid another silent night in the bedroom. Then add in Manscaped's top of the line shower products to have the people thinking, all I want for Christmas is you. Santa cares about his sack and so should you. Look nice when you get your naughty by going to manscaped.com and using skill up for free shipping and 20% off. Now, wasn't that worth the ride? Good job, Manscaped. You should see some of the stuff other sponsors hand me. Manscaped's doing it right. Congrats. But Manscaped aren't out here to sell chuckles. They're out here delivering you the best intimate grooming solutions for you and yours. The Manscaped Platinum Package 4.0 is the one-stop shop for the man who deserves it all. They designed this package to allow you to fully align your entire hygiene routine 
with elite products. Inside this platinum package, you'll find their lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, ultra premium body wash, ultra premium two-in-one shampoo and conditioner, ultra premium deodorant, crop preserver, anti-chafing ball deodorant, crop reviver, ball spray toner, anti-chafing boxes, and the shed travel bag to hold all your goods while traveling. First off, the Lawnmower 4.0. Manscaped say this thing is the greatest ball trimmer ever invented, and since they're pretty much the only entity who specializes in ball trimming, I'm inclined to believe them. These people know balls. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The Lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof and also has a 400K LED spotlight when you need a more precise shave. Ever wanted to spotlight your junk? Well, now you can. Please use responsibly. In addition to shaving, you can now completely upgrade your shower routine with the ultra premium body wash and ultra premium two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. You'll have your skin and hair feeling hydrated and smelling fresh. Don't forget to apply their aluminium free ultra premium deodorant for that cologne quality scent on the go. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts in their Platinum Package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxes and the Shed Travel Bag. Bring your comfort and your boxes to another level. The Platinum Package 4.0 covers all bases from head to toe, the best bang for your shebang. Get 20% off and free shipping with offer code SKILLUP at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use offer code SKILLUP, Manscaped. Get your jingle balls ready for the holidays. That was one of their lines too. Manscaped's copywriters doing my job for me. I thank you and thank you for sponsoring the video.